Natasha. Debbie. Show. The show. <laughs> Welcome to it. <laughs> Just two patriotic girls. Learning about the world. So please, don't take us the wrong way. Hi, welcome to the Rolling Stone show. Yes. I mean, the Natasha and Debbie show. Welcome to the Tongue show. What? (laughs) The Tongue show? (laughs) That's bad. (laughs) I'll see myself out. (laughs) Bye-bye. Goodbye. Go ahead. You got it. No, you got this. Go ahead. I'll be back. Just go ahead. Go ahead. I need a moment. Before we get started, if you like today's episode, please hit that like button. If you like the Rolling Stones, hit the like button. If you like tongues, hit, <laughs> hit the like button. <laughs> to taste things like ice cr- I'm going to stay over here. Continue. And also consider subscribing to our channel. But please check out our content before you do. Is it safe? Yes. Get over here. Hi. <laughs> My middle name is Foot in Your Mouth. Uh, that, that was a big foot in the mouth. <laughs> Chair on the rug, too. You situated yet? Situated. Yeah, situated. Welcome to Debbie Speak. <laughs> we have um, a video we're going to learn some stuff on. That's why we're here, right? We, we are typically here to do learn. that. <laughs> Usually we do. But um, this one is actually something that was touched on for very short moments mm-hmm. in a video we did about a year and a half ago. I think that video, I don't know the exact title, something um, worse British serial killer or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something. Or yeah, murderers something. or something. Um, so it's the Cray Twins, um, and this is by Simon, mm-hmm. and it's called London's Most Notorious Gangsters. As I said in that video we watched about a year and a half ago, they touched on them for all of maybe a minute and a half. <laughs> yeah, if that. So we definitely wanted to take a closer look yeah. at Um Now we Cray know Twins. that Tom Hardy um, mm-hmm. was in a movie they did on the Cray Twins. We now have not seen that movie. Based off this, we'll find out whether or not we're going to watch it. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I don't remember anything about them other than... Them saying they were like gangsters, and I didn't yeah. from that video we watched before feel like they were that big of a deal, but I think we really didn't learn anything from yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think we did. No, I think there's much more to this story. Yeah, because I've heard them pop up in other things, conversations mm-hmm. on our Facebook and our Patreon and stuff too. Yep. So we want to learn about these guys. Were they really that bad? I don't know. You might, you probably do know, but <laughs> that's why we're here. So without any further ado, the Cray Twins, London's most notorious. Gangsters. The East End of London is not a place that has always benefited from a positive reputation. Quite the opposite, in fact. For centuries, it was regarded as one of the city's poorest and most crime-ridden areas. This image was reinforced by writers such as George Gissing, who referred to it as the City of the Dead, and American author Jack London, who actually lived there for a few weeks and gave a first-hand account of the hellish conditions he witnessed in he was sexy, the people wasn't he? of the abyss. Same. The area was filled with working-class people, many of them immigrants who were jammed into overcrowded and dilapidated buildings and often okay. resorted to vices such as drinking and prostitution to forget about the pain of their squalid existence. Wherever right. there weren't tenement buildings, there were glue factories, rendering plants, tanning yards, coal works, soap boilers, and slaughterhouses. All the dirty and foul trades were confined to the East End so as not to tarnish the richer, more fashionable West End of London. Okay, so pause right was there. Also oh, come on. Crime, the rack of highways. <laughs> like- Sorry, we still have space our problems. <laughs> if anyone knows how to fix that. <laughs> uh, so he's talking about back in the, the t- I don't know what time this is yet. Mm-hmm. Is that still the way it is there? I assume it's better now. Is yeah. it? This, this curious. Let us know. Okay. Sorry. Back into that. Located there, a road historically infamous for many <coughs> seedy businesses, but also where the notorious Ratcliffe murders took place. Whitechapel is also in the East End, the area once prowled by Jack the Ripper. During the mid-20th oh, okay. century, the area became more and more associated with organized crime, and two brothers soon emerged as the undisputed kings of the East End. They were the Cray Twins, and alongside their gang, which they dubbed The Firm, they were responsible for most criminal rackets mm. in the area during the 1950s. But this was just the beginning for Ronnie and Reggie, as they used their influence and money to open nightclubs in the West End. These were popular and fashionable, and all of a sudden the Cray Twins were celebrities in their own right, mingling with stars and socialites from both London and across the pond. The Crays became an integral part of the pop culture of the swinging 60s in the UK, just as much as miniskirts, mods, and music. So the 60s, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Firm. Hmm. 
Ronald and Reginald Cray were born on October 24, 1933 in Hoxton, East London, to Charles Sr. and Violet Annie Cray. They were twins, although Reggie was 10 minutes older than Ronnie. They also had another brother, Charles James, who was 6 years older than both of them. Their father was a traveling trader who roamed the country buying and selling various items, particularly clothing and jewelry. His presence in the twins' life was sporadic, not only due to his job, but also because he had to go on the run in 1942 after refusing to be conscripted into World War II. Oh. The boys' upbringing was mainly handled by the many women in their lives, their mother, their aunts, and their grandmothers. Ronnie and Reggie left school when they were both 15 years old, looking for employment. They worked various odd jobs, including six months in the Billingsgate fish market, which would end up becoming the longest legitimate job that they would ever have. The twins also started developing a reputation as neighborhood tough guys, always getting into fights and other scrapes. Their maternal grandfather, Jimmy Cannonball Lee, used to be a boxer in his day, so he turned them onto the sport. Both siblings were quite proficient, although Reggie was a standard. <laughs> Debbie's requesting a pause. And <laughs> I have the mouse on my side. <laughs> you do. I just have to point over there. Um, it's, it's interesting that they they were into boxing and fighting to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, seems like that kind of tended to lead pe people down the wrong path. Well, in, like here, you know, in the people times. that were poverty stricken, they would go to boxing because you didn't go to boxing mm -hmm. for just the heck of it. You no know, one really wanted to, I shouldn't say wanted to do it, mm -hmm. but most people in America at least. Would, would only pick boxing if they had nothing else. You right. Know, kind of way out. Sure. But as I'm hearing this, I'm like, this just sounds like a story from New York uh -huh. City. Everything they're saying, like yeah. even the, the, was it Cannibal was the, the nickname or the middle yeah. name for, um, mm -hmm. it's like, this sounds like a New York City story. Yep. And they even kind of have that, that like almost Italian mobster look to them. Mm -hmm. So this is quite interesting. So, all right, back into it schoolboy champion and made it to the finals of the Great Britain schoolboy event. Her other brother, Charlie, recalled that boxing was one of the first things to showcase the different personalities of the twins. Okay. Reggie was cool and calculated. He showed skill and willingness to learn from advice. Ronnie, on the other hand, was a bit more of a raging bull who yeah. charged headfirst and usually won by overpowering his opponent. One personality okay. trait they did share, however, was that neither brother responded well to authority, as was exemplified in 1952 when they were called up for national service in the British Army. Back then, all young healthy males between 17 and 21 years of age were required to serve two years in the armed forces. In the case okay. of Ronnie and Reggie, they were assigned to an infantry regiment called the Royal Fusiliers at the Tower of London, but immediately got into trouble when they arrived there. They got into an argument with one of the training sergeants. They Not beat him idea. up and left the barracks to go back home. The twins were arrested the following day and sent to military prison. In fact, most of their time no. doing national service was spent either in a military prison or going on the run. They often hmm. got into fights, left their barracks without permission, and unsurprisingly, they both got caught Marshaled and received dishonorable discharges, after which they yep. were transferred to a civilian prison to serve some time for several offenses that they committed off base. Oh, wow. Well, this started off pretty bad, and it's yeah. going to be worse, I can already see. <clears throat> the court marshals pretty much sunk both of their boxing careers, so after they got out, the yeah. kids needed to find something new to do. They started out small. They got a loan from their older brother and leased a pool hall in Bethnal Green. During their time spent in jail, Ronnie and Reggie had already befriended plenty of other shady characters, and the pool hall soon turned into a regular haunt for many of their army buddies and other local hoodlums. The twins and their entourage would often gather at the club, then go out at night to the pubs, where two things were always guaranteed to happen, drinking and brawling. As a means of making money, the twins took advantage mm -hmm. of the fact that their billiard hall wasn't yet on the police's radar, so they allowed a few local fences to store their stolen goods there and even conduct business, with a cut of the profits going to the craze of course. Inevitably, this got them unwanted attention from some of the other neighborhood gangsters who did not appreciate the twins doing business on their turf. Specifically, the craze received a message from three brothers, all dock workers who invited the twins to stop by their pub on a Sunday morning for a drink and to talk. Of course, Ronnie and Reggie understood that this was a trap, but they went anyway. As soon as they entered, the door was locked and mm. the pub landlord made himself scarce as the three dockers lunged at the twins to teach them a lesson. Sorry, I'm not as they <laughs> He said the pub landlord made himself scared. So I'm like, Al Murray was there. What? Don't think it was that landlord. <laughs> Al Murray was there. I was like, hey, I gotcha. I'm out. <laughs> oh, y'all have converted me into knowing these things. <laughs> Any other Americans that would watch us for the first time on this episode would be like, what are they, they talking about? wouldn't necessarily put those two things together. <laughs> me watching you myself two years together. ago in, a, in the future would be like, what uh -huh. is she? What? Did, what? How did she? What did she talk about? <laughs> okay, sorry. Back into it. 
understood that this was a trap, but they went <laughs> anyway. As soon as they entered, the door was locked, and the pub landlord made it some scarce as the three dockers lunged at the twins to teach them a lesson. But it didn't go as they planned. When the landlord returned, he found two of the dock workers unconscious, while the uh -oh. third one was still being pummeled senseless by Ronnie Cray. Jeez. Although young, the Crays made it pretty evident that they were legitimate tough guys who could not be intimidated, and their gang grew pretty quickly. By the time they turned 21 years old, the Crays had their fingers in a lot of pies, including extortion, theft, gambling, robbery, and cons. Nice. This was all still wow. local, though, and the Crays were ready to move up in the world. In 1956, they became embroiled in a gang war as the two top kingpins of the East End, Billy Hill and Jack Spot Comer, fought for power. Comer Never used the Crays for muscle, mm -hmm. but ultimately, they were on the losing side. One night, Comer and his wife were attacked by Hill's enforcer, Mad Frankie Frazier, and his men. He had his face slashed very badly, and eventually, Comer decided to call it quits while he was still uh. alive. Wow. That's her. Despite coming up on top, Billy Hill didn't remain involved in the underworld of London's East End for long. The departures of him and Coma created a power void, and several new gangs rose up to fill it. Unsurprisingly, one of them belonged to the Crays, who called their burgeoning crime outfit The Firm. Ronnie and Reggie were, of course, at the head of the table. Their older brother, Charlie Cray, was also a member, although he later claims not to have been involved in the violent stuff, and mainly to have acted oh, yeah, as they the always do. I was involved in the violent stuff. Yeah. A nah. cousin named Ronnie Hart was also part of The Firm, as were <clears> dozens of other men. We're not going to name them all, but just a few other key members were John Dixon, Albert Donahue, Ian Barry, and Connie Whitehead. In just a few years, the firm emerged as one of London's most dangerous gangs, as the Crays controlled a large area of the East End where every business, be it legitimate or illegal, paid its dues to the twins. Mm -hmm. Of course, with this ascendancy within London's criminal underworld, it also came more attention from the police. The Crays first got into hot water in late 1956, when Ronnie shot someone for the first time. The target was a man okay. who threatened to beat up a car dealer under the protection of the firm. Ronnie got into a fight with him, and during the struggle, shot the guy once in the leg. The man later went to the police, but the Crays got off using a bit of twin trickery. The authorities oh. picked up one of the Crays, oh. they formally charged him, and the victim ID'd him. Only after this was done did the accused reveal himself to be Reggie Cray not Ronnie and presented an airtight alibi for the time nice. of the shooting. Embarrassed yeah. the police had no choice right. but to release him. Yeah. The whole matter was dropped after the victim received some <clears throat> unofficial compensation from the mm. firm for his suffering. Now, not mm. all altercations went this smoothly. Later that same year, the Crays became partners in a West End club called The Stragglers, located in Soho. It was the first of many such ventures, but in this particular case, the role of the Crays was to keep out the troublemakers looking to start fights so that the club could begin attracting a higher class of clientele. Unsurprisingly, this led to conflict. Bobby Ramsey, the guy who brought in the Crays on the deal, got on the wrong side of a gang called the Watney Streeters, who ambushed him one night and gave him a serious beating. The Crays had no choice but to respond to this attack, so a few weeks later, the firm raided a pub called the Britannia, which which was a hangout of the Watneys. However, the latter got wind of the attack, so everybody managed to escape out of the back door, except for a guy called Terry Martin, who was stabbed and beaten to within an inch of his life. Yeah. Later that night, as cars with firm members prowled the East End looking for more Watneys, one of them was stopped by a police patrol. It contained Ramsey and Ronnie Cray, who were both arrested for the assault of Terry Martin. Reggie was also brought in, but he was later released. Ronnie, on the other hand, got three years in jail. In November 1956, he went to Wandsworth Prison, leaving Reggie Cray as the sole boss of the firm. At first, Ronnie took to prison life reasonably well thanks to his connections and entourage that provided him with all the comforts that one could find on the inside. However, things got worse after he was transferred away from London. He was showing signs of paranoia, which only got worse after huh. he heard that his aunt Rose had passed away. Nowadays, it would have been deemed a paranoid schizophrenic with homicidal tendencies, oh, really? but in the 1950s, he was simply oh. diagnosed with prison psychosis. Okay, pause uh, there. Mm. So he was actually a paranoid schizophrenic. Yeah. Who was a boxer and military trained for a uh -huh. moment. Yeah, scary, yeah, that's, terrifying. Yep. That's the most dangerous thing on planet Earth right there. It definitely is. <laughs> All right. That changes so the narrative for me a bit. And, uh, can get the power and yeah. Doesn't that change the narrative for you too? Oh yeah. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, not just another mobster. Dangerous. Yes. <laughs> not that all mobsters aren't, but mm -hmm. um, like your family. My family. She's Italian. <laughs> <clears throat> No, but it's, uh, I find it fascinating how we don't know about these guys, like, you know, and a couple of the mm -hmm. other more prolific, um, bad people in the UK. Like, we don't hear about that here in, yeah. in America, typically. Um, I guess the most popular one is just Jack the Ripper. Yeah, let's see where this is going, because it just keeps getting worse and worse. 
justified and sane. On the outside, Reggie Cray was doing significantly better. Although he was a very violent man, he was more cool and collected than his brother was, and uh -huh. he was more interested in becoming a successful businessman than a tough gangster. Reggie okay. also thought it was time to move out of the <clears throat> pool hall into new headquarters, so he opened the Double R Club on Bow Road. It became quite a trendy London hangout, and gave the Crays their first taste of mingling with the stars. Charlie Cray, who was brought in to handle the day-to-day -day running of the club, even had a six-month fling with an actress and future dame Barbara Windsor, most famous for her roles in the Carry On films. In 1959, Ronnie Cray was released from prison. The following year, the Betting and Gaming Act of 1960 was passed, which legalized additional forms of gambling in the UK. The Crays okay. were among the first to take <coughs> advantage of this new law when they opened a gambling club called Esmeralda's Barn. It became a giant goldmine for the twins, but trouble <laughs> struck again as this time Reggie was given an 18-month prison sentence for attempted extortion. Huh. Finally, in 1961, both Crays were out and free of legal troubles. The firm was established as one of London's biggest and baddest criminal outfits, collecting tributes each month from a long list of businesses that extended beyond the East End. Furthermore, the Crays' developing reputation as successful club owners meant that they kept receiving new offers from other clubs wanting to take them on as partners. Hang Business on. Dang it. was booming. They're wanting they that from receiving... it. I'm not pausing that picture because <clears throat> they've shown this picture a few times. Mm -hmm. And couple times they showed them when it looks to be some sort of a TV interview. Yeah. What's that from? I want to know why. What's the context of that? Mm, you yeah. know, if they were criminals and in and out of jail and stuff like that, why were they on television? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe they, did, maybe they did interview them for like maybe a club opening or something. I don't know. Let us know. Or from if after you know. being out of jail. I mean, I have Could no be. idea. Not typically you see mobsters on TV getting interviewed. Mm -hmm. It's a little odd. And then this photo looks professionally done <clears throat> so okay. i'm just wondering what are the what is the context behind that if anyone knows please let us know in the comments because i find that interesting mm -hmm. and spooky you know yeah a little spooky it is a little eerie okay sorry guys and i keep wanting to go to that space bar new offers from other clubs wanting to take them on as partners. Business was booming. The Crays were making a lot of money while living out their fantasy lifestyles and rubbing elbows with the rich and powerful. Strangely enough, when the twins did find themselves embroiled in scandal, it had nothing to do with their criminal empire, but rather for their sexual exploits. Wait, what? For most of his life, Ronnie Cray was openly gay and had a lot <gasps> of relationships with young men who worked in his nightclubs and gambling huh. halls. Later on, he married two women while incarcerated, Elaine Mildner and Kate Howard, but he divorced them both after a few years. Reggie preferred to keep it more private. He was also married twice, and to the world at large, he maintained that he was straight. Although rumors that he was bisexual had always persisted, it was mainly after Reggie's death that some of the people close to him mentioned that he had had several relationships with men. The reason this became relevant was because in 1964, a British tabloid ran a story about a prominent politician and member of the House of Lords who was having an affair with a notorious gangster. They even had a photograph of the two together, but due to British libel laws, they could not publish it or even mention the name of the politician. The foreign oh, press, however, had no such concern for these laws, so a German publication named the Boss, Ronnie Cray and Lord Boothby. Obviously, huh. the Member of Parliament denied this allegation, huh. claiming that he only met Ronnie Cray for a business meeting. He sued the tabloid and won a large settlement, plus a public apology, which discouraged other newspapers from covering the story. However, decades later, declassified files showed that the Home Office took the matter very seriously and had Boothby secretly investigated by MI5. The report described Lord Boothby as a kinky fellow, but mentioned that the tabloids got the story wrong. He and Ronnie Cray were not having an affair, but they did attend a few gay parties together, as they both preferred younger men. Ultimately, huh. MI5 concluded Concluded that the matter okay. was no national concern, so the Boothby affair was largely forgotten. Once again, the craze were back to businesses. Okay, but hold on. But so maybe it what wasn't. Uh, uh, what did he say? Like they were no longer a national concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the whole sexual act thing that isn't so much, but the fact that they know each other, <laughs> right? And then a politician's <laughs> hanging out with a gangster, <laughs> exactly, with a criminal. Because that not be more of a concern <laughs> just, uh, than whether or not they were. Having a relationship. Having fun. I mean, what? Yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever, you know, like the fact that they know each other at all uh -huh. and are hanging out together at all in any capacity, mm -hmm. you're a politician. Exactly. You're a known criminal. Yep. That's my concern right there. That is the concern. But yeah, oh, no, no, they weren't having sex together. Everything's good. <laughs> exactly. Uh huh? <laughs> exactly. But, uh, okay, just wanted to throw that out there. Sorry long after that business was disrupted permanently. Okay, so what does that mean? What happened? The hat and the what? Blind beggar.
The firm seemed pretty protected from the law, but the same could not be said when it came to other gangs. There were still plenty okay. of dangerous criminals in London's underworld who had no love for the Cray twins, and chief among them was the Richardson gang. They were rivals of the firm throughout the 1960s and often butted heads over the same rackets. They were quite vicious with a reputation for torture and included members such okay. as the leaders Charles and Eddie Richardson, the aforementioned mad Frankie Frazier, and a giant bull of a man with a mean streak named George Cornell, a former member of the Watney Street gang. The the conflict between the two groups <laughs> reached its peak on March the 8th, 1966, when a large-scale fight between the two sides erupted at a club named Mr. Smith's. Okay. The three men were seriously injured during a brawl, and an associate of the craze named Dickie Hart was shot and killed. Roddy and Reggie were not present during the fight, and neither was Cornell on the side of the Richardsons. Two days later, however, George Cornell went to the hospital to visit one of the gang members who got injured in the fight. After he left, he stopped for a drink at a pub in Whitechapel called The Blind Beggar. Unbeknownst to him, the Craze and a few other members of the firm were drinking in another pub just a few hundred yards away. Somebody called to inform them of Cornell's uh -oh. whereabouts, at which point Ronnie Cray got into a car with John Dixon and uh -oh. Ian Barry and drove to The Blind Beggar. As soon as they entered the pub, George Cornell turned around and said something along the lines of, well, just look who's here. Uh -oh. Those were his last words Sorry. as Ronnie Cray walked uh -oh. up to him, pulled out a 9mm pistol, and shot him in the head. Barry shot a few Jeez. times in the ceiling wow. for intimidation, and the couple calmly walked out of the blind beggar and drove away. Despite oh. the obvious nature of the crime, Ronnie was safe from the law for the time being. The police were finding it hard to build a case against him as nobody wanted to testify. Either that, or mm. they were waiting for the right moment when they would be able to send both twins to prison at once. They didn't have to wait too long. Although Reggie was usually mm. the more level-headed sibling, in 1967 he too fell into a deep depression with violent mood swings after his wife, Frances Shear, died of an apparent suicide. This led him to oh. committing his first and, as far as we know, only murder, something which he did at the insistence of his brother, who up until that point had been annoyed by the fact that Reggie never took that fatal final step. The target was really? a criminal named Jack the Hat McVitty. He wasn't a member of the firm, but he was an associate used for the occasional job. At the time, he was on bad terms with the twins, chiefly for bungling a hit he was supposed to carry out and then refusing to pay back the advance he was given. On the night of October the 28th, 1967, most of the firm was drinking at a pub called The Carpenter's Arms when word came in that McVitty was <laughs> on his way. The craze cleared the place of other guests and got into an argument with him as soon as he walked through the door. Reggie pulled out a gun and squeezed the trigger, but it jammed. He then pounced on McVitie, and with his brother screaming next to him, he began to stab him in the face, neck, and chest. Are you Once kidding? Once was done, some of the other firm members disposed of the body, which has never been recovered. Oh, wow. Okay. Huh. That's brutal. Asperger. The death of Jackie McVitty <clears throat> proved to be the beginning of the end for the Cray twins. For starters, it caused a lot of tension within the firm, as members felt like what had happened to McVitty could also happen to them. Furthermore, unbeknownst to the Crays, Scotland Yard had been collecting evidence and testimonies against them since 1964 Good under job. the command of mm. Leonard Nipper Reed. In May 1968, the police decided that it was now or never and arrested almost 20 members of the firm, hoping that the evidence they had gathered would be lot. enough to convince some of them to take deals. Fortunately, the Crays did a lot of the hard work for them because their master plan to avoid jail time for any murders was simply to have other members of the firm take the blame on their behalf. Shockingly, this wasn't well received, and some of those gang members gave evidence against the craze. Of particular importance was the testimony of a former business partner of the firm named Leslie Payne. He was the mm. one that Jack the Hat failed to kill, so naturally, since the craze had put a hit out on him, he didn't feel particularly loyal towards them. Lastly, yeah. the barmaid at the Blind Beggar accepted police protection and identified Ronnie Cray as the man who killed George Cornell. Okay. In 1969, Good. Ronnie and Reggie Cray were each found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years served. Man, they this was at the time longest yeah. sentence for murder given out at the Old Bailey. Eight other gangsters were found guilty of murder or being accessories to murder, bringing an end to the firm. For a few years, okay. the brothers were together in the maximum security wing of Parkhurst Prison. However, he was running schizophrenia he was transferred mm -hmm. to Broadmoor Mental Hospital, where he spent the rest of his life until his death in 1995 at the age of 61. Reggie Cray wow. was released from prison on compassionate grounds in September 2000. Why he's released? Cancer, and he spent the last few weeks at home before dying yeah, the following cancer. month, age 66. Oh, wow. The Cray's grasp on the criminal London underworld might have ended over 50 years ago, <clears> but their notoriety and unique place in pop culture is still going strong. Okay. Well, that's definitely a lot more in depth than the like two minutes we learned before. It definitely was. <laughs> I'm just, they were gangsters and they were bad. Yeah. Um, huh. Yeah, I can definitely um, see why they're they're well known. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there was inter deal like international dealings with 
I'm sure there was with certain different groups in like the gangster world. Yeah. You know, like in the mobster world. Yeah, like over here, over there. Yeah. You know, playing yeah, off I'm of sure stuff. There was a little bit, yeah. And uh, I'd like lot. to have more information on <laughs> their time together in in prison at the end. Mm -hmm. Like what happened in there? Like did they run that place? Um, I did think that was quite fascinating. And if you thought so too, please hit the like button. Consider subscribing to the channel. We'd certainly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, definitely. Um, more than than I expected and like I said, you know, I don't remember which brother was which now I apologize mm -hmm. um, But the one who was uh, schizophrenic. Yeah um, You know, I don't know at the time. Well, even now like someone like him. I don't know if I don't know what he can really do, you know Yeah, I'm not sure either. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you uh, help someone control that before someone I guess you can't force someone so no, but it's uh I mean, it's sad too, you know, that you, these guys probably were pretty smart, you know, and could have probably done something really great mm -hmm. in the world. It's the path you take, you know, and where does that path start? And that's a whole psychological conversation that we are sure not is. equipped to <laughs> go through. We have so much stuff over here about mafia, mobsters, you know, whether yep. it's whatever, New York, other places as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so to finally hear our first uh, taste of that in the UK, uh, we need to watch Peaky Blinders. We need to actually do that. We've never we done it. It's time. I think it's time to happen. Thank you guys so much for watching. We hope that you, uh, well, enjoyed. You know, it's kind of weird with some episodes to say, <laughs> hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, learn something. If you did, let us know. Um, I know there's stuff here we didn't, you know, Simon and anybody in yes. any video never gets it all. Nobody ever does get everything that we need to know. So, so leave please us leave us a comment of something that was not mentioned in the video. And I want to say a special shout out today to a good friend of ours, Mandy Potts. We love you. Um, just random. Just wanted to say that. Hi, Mandy. Hi, Mandy. Um, but thank you all for watching. We appreciate it. And we'll, we'll see you on the, well, 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 what did I just say? <laughs> we will see you on the next episode. Oh, then it's Tasha and Debbie show. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, guys, please love like jazz. Be as strong as Tyson. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.